We're in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 19 through 22. Tonight we're going to talk about the sins of ministers. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 19 through 22. The sins of ministers. Here we are in chapter 5 and we'll read in verse 19. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others may also, uh, others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, excuse me, I lost my place. Uh, and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing but by partiality. Lay hands. Suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Drink no longer wine, water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. So here we have this uh, passage here through verse, 20, uh, uh, verse 23. And we're looking at the sins of ministers and the troubles that uh, can accompany the ministry. So he's going to begin to uh, talk to you. First, he's just spoken to you about a good minister and being sure to be uh, to compensate the minister, make sure you pay him, and uh, it shows your value that you place on your spiritual well-being. You would pay for other services, and you would pay for other uh, uh, things in your life that are important to you. Uh, the the more important it is, the more you're willing to pay for it. Now you pay for the. A doctor, you'd pay for the mechanic, but you'd pay want to pay you want to have a mechanic who does what he's he's supposed to do, but you're more concerned that your doctor does what he's supposed to do. And when it comes to your minister, the most important part of your life, you want to be sure that he is the kind of minister that is going to uh, do right by you. And then of course uh, the Bible says here he's worthy of that honor if he holds it well and he labors in the word and doctrine. And so now it goes on to this, uh, to these troubles that the minister may have. And so we see here in verse uh, 19, it says, Against an elder receive not an accusation. So he's going to start by a warning to him about uh, accusers and the sins of ministers. And, and he says, be careful when people come to speak to you about the, uh, about the minister. He says, don't receive an accusation. Now this is probably going to be... A accus an accusation uh, that would need to be tried and judged upon. So in other words, there is going to be an action taken and, and they would come to Timothy because he would have a superior position and he would be able to hear the accusations and they're having a trouble maybe with some of the ministers. And so this is the this is the um, the warning. He says, don't receive an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So he's saying, don't just listen to everybody complain about the pastor, and certainly not to make accusations against him, because really the, tar the pastor is going to be a target. He's going to be a target, because there are liars, and there are cheats, and there are uh, people who are wicked, who will make up things. And he said, they don't trust every witness against the pastor. Don't be first to assume the worst against the minister. Assume the best. And then when people come to talk to you about him, I'll make sure that there's some witnesses to what's going on. Now, uh, I have heard that this has been abused in some um, cults and so forth, and what they will do is they will use this verse in the Bible to keep us uh, to suppress uh, crimes that are against children by the minister. Well, nobody saw it. There's not two or three witnesses, so we won't tell anyone. And because they're in a cult, instead of going to the police, they go to their ministers. And the ministers tell them, well, there's only two, there's not two or three witnesses, there's only one. And therefore, you can't tell anybody, you can't hear, you can't uh, make this witness to anyone, and they won't go tell the police if there's been a crime committed. And I don't believe that that's, this is what's being talked about. If there's a crime that's committed, then uh, obviously everybody who's concerned needs to be, to be uh, spoken to, but the police need to be involved. And this is not a passage of scripture that says you can't call the police unless three people saw what happened. Uh, if there's a crime committed, a crime needs to be reported. But the, pro the problem is that there are people who will have the, the minister in, his crosshair, in their crosshairs. And they will think of ways in order to destroy the pastor. And they'll make up stories about the pastor. So it's important for the, uh, the minister here in Timothy's case to hope all things. To, to believe all things. To hope all things. And beware that people want to attack the pastor. So it's our responsibility to uh, support the pastor and to know the pastor and to help him because people will make the pastor a target and they will make accusations against him. 
And so it says that uh, against an elder, receive not an accusation. And these are going to be accusations about sin, uh, serious allegations that the minister has uh, come into failure, come into troubles. Obviously not um, every single thing that the pastor is go going to do is going to be seen, but if it's been seen by their people and it's an open sin, then it needs to be dealt with. And the pastor ought not to um, be able to be a wicked man and remain in the ministry. But he says this next in verse 20, Them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. And I think what we need to recognize, obviously, is that not only ought we to be very careful in listening to accusations against the pastor, all of us do, and, and any pastor really. We need to be careful about listening to a, an individual make complaints about a pastor. Um, unless there's witnesses to it, unless it's the truth. And even then, it's got to not just be gossip. It ought not to just be talking about different ministers and the troubles that you had with them. There ought to be a reason for it. But should there be genuine uh, uh, issue, um, we need to remember that pastors are not infallible. Pastors are not beyond sin. Uh, they are not of, um, on a spiritual level in which they can't sin. Pastors do sin. They make mistakes. They, they err just like everyone else. And we would like to think that our pastor is never going to sin at all. And it, you know, the, the reality is the pastor would like that too, for the most part. I mean, most pastors would like to be able to be at a place where they don't do anything wrong and they could please God all the time, but it's not going to happen. And the, the one thing that the pastor would want to do is to please God at all times. But then the next thing the pastor would want to do is never to say anything that would hurt somebody, even on accident. And that's not going to happen either. The pastor is never going to be in a position where the things he says never offends anybody, especially people he cares about and loves. It can happen. And so you need to remember your pastor is not infallible. Give him the, the mercy and the grace that you would want extended to you. Should you say something you wish you hadn't said, and we've all done it, we've all gotten hot under the collar, we've all been a little too hungry, a little too perturbed, and not everything's gone our way that day, and we've said something to somebody we wish we hadn't said. And it can happen, and pastors need to guard their mouths. But it is possible, and give your pastor the courtesy that maybe he's having a bad day. He's human just like everybody else. He makes mistakes. But it ought not to be a thing where the pastor's going on in sin. It ought not to be a thing where your pastor goes on and he's being wicked, and he's doing things against the, law, the will of God. It says, them that sin rebuke before all, that others may fear. He's not infallible, but he's to be rebuked. Rebuke before all. And consider the implications of that when the pastor gets rebuked before the whole congregation. Uh, it's a humbling experience for the pastor. It is a, um, uh, it is a, a situation of, uh, of contrition, hopefully, for the pastor. A time for him to recognize what he's done. And why, the reason they're rebuking him before all, and the reason the injunction here is rebuking him before all, is because this sin is obviously before two or three witnesses. There's people who saw this. And whatever happened, the pastor needs to make a public apology. Because you can almost guarantee that if three people saw it, then the whole church knows about it. If two people saw it, then somehow it's going to get out that the pastor's done something. And of course, they have to go tell somebody, so now more people know. And generally, the pastor has, obviously, a prominent position. And when you have a more prominent position, you need a more prominent apology. When you make a, have a public position, you have make a public apology. So, for instance, and a good rule of thumb, is that if, you, um, uh, if, if you're in a crowd of people and you say something to somebody that hurts their feelings, you ought not to go beside, aside and say to that person, look, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. If you see it happen, you need to say it right there in front of everybody. Hey, listen, I'm sorry I just said that that was wrong of me. And you need to apologize to everybody and tell them all that it's not true what you just said. Or that it's not right. Because you hurt somebody in public, you ought to apologize in public if possible. If you, uh, if you injure somebody's reputation in a public setting, you ought to apologize in a public setting. So that you can right the wrong as best you can. Don't then uh, hurt them in public and apologize in private. And I heard that as a good illustration. You praise people in public and you correct them in private. That's a good... I, I, I just uh, wanted to pass that good little bit of wisdom along. When you have to praise somebody, you praise them in public. And when you have to correct them, you correct them in private. That's a good rule of thumb for everybody to have. You, you see somebody doing something wrong, don't correct them in front of everybody. Because you could hurt them. 
and embarrass them and shame them. And that's not the point of correcting somebody. You don't want to hurt them and injure their feelings. You take them aside in private and say what you have to say, just in case it doesn't go right. And generally, if you do want, need to correct somebody in public, there's a lot of possibility that it won't go right at that time because you just did it in public. And what are they going to do? They're going to respond negatively trying to protect their reputation and they're going to be offended in it. So it's possible to offend people in public just by doing your job as a minister, correcting people in public is a bad idea. You take them aside and you correct them privately so that it's not a shame to them, an embarrassment to them. And it's the same thing in your job if you have employees or you're a supervisor or you're a parent. You do the same thing for your kids, for your employees. You correct them in private if possible and there's times when you need to correct them in public. And then you praise them everywhere in public if you can so that everybody hears it and that helps them to feel like uh, that, that you really mean it. Boy, when somebody hears, wow, that's a great job you did there, and everybody hears it, that, and that builds them up. And you should do the same for your wife or your husband. You should correct them in private, and you should uh, encourage them and praise them in public. You should praise them in private, too. But the point is, if you're able to speak kindly about your husband or kindly about your wife in, in public, take that opportunity. Make a habit of it. It's a good habit. But the pastor, he's going to be able to... Um, uh, offend people very easily with his words. So we have to be very careful with what we say and you have to be very careful with what you hear. Uh, be careful not to be offended by the pastor if possible. But should he do something wrong, he needs to be rebuked publicly. And obviously that needs to be dealt with amongst the pastors, the, 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 the deacons, the men of the church, and they need to discuss it and they need to talk about it, whether or not something rises to the level of needing to be rebuked publicly. And when it does, they need to take care of it. And there's two objects when someone's rebuked. The first is to recover them. Because as Christians, we want to recover everyone who sins. We don't want to kick them out and send them off. The object needs to first be to recover them so that they will, uh, will continue to keep them as a brother. But if they can't be recovered, then we need to disassociate with them. And we need to kick them out. And if necessary, we will excommunicate or disfellowship with them, is the word we'll use. We would, we would rather recover someone, but if they can't be recovered, they need to be disfellowshipped. Sometimes sins uh, need to be rebuked publicly, and the person needs to be disfellowshipped. They need to be kicked out of the, the church, they need to be asked to leave, they don't have a repentant spirit, and they need to go. And when it becomes, when it's a pastor, if he's sinned greatly and he needs to be rebuked by the church, then in all likelihood he needs to step down from the ministry and, and get his act together and, and get his in life in order. And he doesn't have any business being a pastor either at that time or maybe ever again. Uh, you wouldn't take a, a thief and then put him in charge of the money, right? Because that would be a, a very great temptation for him. And if someone has a problem, apparently, um, for whatever reason, we've got a number of large churches in this area in our South Florida where the pastors have run off with some woman or they've had an affair with a woman and like, cheated on their wives. And there seems to be some sort of a temptation with the, the pastor there as he has uh, the uh, authority uh, to take advantage of the relationship he has with some woman. Well, it may be that the man doesn't need to be in that place of authority ever again. And if he's cheated on his wife, then he needs to step down out of the ministry. And for all, in all likelihood, he should never be a pastor again because now he's broken his vows and he's not a one-woman man and he's cheated on his wife. And that causes him to... He can still be a Christian and he probably wouldn't want to stay in his church, but he needs to be in church. He's not out of church, but he at least needs to recognize that he's made a great failure in his life and you forfeit the right to be a minister when you make such great errors in your, uh, in your ministry. You, may never, you should probably never be trusted again to be in the ministry. And what a sad thing. But there are some people who are so uh, powerful in the way that they preach that the people want them to come back. And they want them to preach to them. And uh, for some reason they look at the man instead of the the error that he's made and instead of the person having the dignity to say you know I've, I've made the kind of error that's caused me to not be in the ministry anymore um, they hear all those calls for people to come back and preach and they'll, they'll go and do it again and they'll become a pastor again and uh, there are people who've pastored two and three churches and, and done it again and done it again and there, I've heard of 
ministers that have um, uh, that have failed with multiple women and still gotten a pastorate at another place just because of their the power of their name or the power of their preaching. Um, obviously, people are looking at um, the uh, the the form of godliness and not the power of godliness. The sound of their preaching, the format of their messages, the name which they carry, and the reputation, rather than the effects and the powerful the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Obviously, someone has not got the power of the Holy Spirit with them if they're making such grave errors. But they need to be rebuked publicly. And if you look here um, in uh, chapter 5, Verse 1, we'll notice in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, it says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And then in this passage it says, I charge thee before all, let's see, what's that, verse uh, 20, Then uh, them that sin, rebuke before all. So on the one hand he tells Timothy, don't rebuke them, and on the other hand he tells them to rebuke them. The one is speaking to elders, meaning that the, uh, uh, the older men, and this is speaking to pastors, uh, speaking about pastors, but the comparison is this, rebuke not an elder. And this is dealing with just Timothy or anybody really coming up to the pastor and giving them what for. This is just speaking about the general walking up to your pastor and rebuking him, be it publicly or privately. And this is a personal rebuke from you to the pastor. The Bible says that that is not appropriate, that it needs to be, uh, you need to entreat them as a father if they're, if they're elders. And then, uh, like, as I mentioned, this is geared towards the elder men of the church. Then, when it comes to pastors, I might have said that wrong just a moment ago, but when it comes to speaking to men who are older than you, you're not to personally just rebuke them. You are to entreat them as a father. But when it comes to corporately, when it comes to having to um, have an accusation against the pastor, the church is to come together and to find whether or not there's fault or innocence, guilt or not, and then they are to reprove the pastor. They are to reprove the elder because he's sinned publicly. So this is different between the personal rebuking somebody rather than entreating them who's older than you, and the a corporate handling of, of, of a serious matter where there's witnesses and where there's proof. And so obviously one is going to essentially be um, an, probably an emotional outburst, whereas this one's deliberated over, it's prayed over, it's, there's uh, been uh, interviews sought, there's been listening, there's been hearing of charges, and there's been investigation, and there's been questions. So this is not an emotional outburst. This is the church coming together. So on the one hand, we're not to rebuke an elder. Be careful how you walk up and just speak to anyone who's older than you. You need to treat them as a father. And then on the other hand, the church is to handle this rebuking of the pastor. And sometimes the pastor needs to be rebuked publicly, and sometimes the pastor needs to be rebuked privately. Sometimes it's better for the... Uh, for the other elders or the, the deacons to take the pastor aside, have a meeting, and tell them that this is going on, and here's, how, here's what we think about it. And uh, here's what we believe is going on and what's happening. And maybe that's as far as it needs to go. And maybe not doesn't need to be a public rebuke in the sense of bringing it before the whole church. Just depending on the situation. And there needs to be wisdom and compassion. And the idea is to recover the offender. That's the purpose. That's the idea. Re recover the offender. You want to salvage people. You want to help them. You don't want to hurt them. And that's where we're going to go with this. The aim is going to be holiness. And notice what it says here in verse um, uh, 20. Let's see, I keep losing my place. In verse 20, uh, verse 20, that others may also fear. You see that phrase, that others may also fear? The idea there is that if you handle the pastor correctly and he's publicly rebuked if there's sin, then there will be holiness in the, in the church. People will be more likely to keep from sin. They'll, be, they'll fear that they would fall. If the pastor could fall, then I might fall. And they want to be careful 
not to fall into the same temptations. And so this public rebuke is for the purpose of not only recovering the pastor, but also protecting the people from sin. And the whole idea has to do with holiness. The whole idea has to do with doing right. The whole idea has to do with protecting people from sin that others may fear. Not that they would fear that you would publicly rebuke them and that's why they would do right because they're afraid someone will find out. Or they're afraid they'll get publicly rebuked. But the, re the reality is they see that this is a serious matter. And that sin is a serious matter. And for all reality, sometimes the public rebuke is enough fear to cause you to snap out of your foolishness. And so this is a, um, a, a preservative. And everywhere in the Bible we see these preservatives from sin to keep you from sin, to keep you on that right way. And the Bible tells us that God will uh, perfect what He began. He will start it and increase it. From glory to glory, God increases it. And He uh, stamps His image on our hearts and He, he creates us and, and we're predestined to be conformed to the image of God. And everywhere in the Bible, this is this idea of us becoming more Christ-like is, is. And so we, we find that these are encouragements for the church because the church, when it functions correctly, everybody helps each other. Everybody helps each other be holy. And everybody will, and people will help others different, in different ways. You know, maybe the ladies can help the ladies. And according to the scripture, we have the older women helping the younger women. And the older men are helping the younger men. And the, the, um, uh, the children are being helped by the, the moms. And the, the, uh, the church is being helped by the pastor and the evangelist. And so God puts people into places so that your, your hope of having a holy life increases. Your help in having a holy life increases. And so this is just one of those things that God has put in place that we cannot abandon, we cannot set it aside because it's very, very uncool to publicly rebuke the pastor. Uh, it is very, very um, uh, un... Uh, it's against the times to come down on people's sins. It is against the times to tell people when they're wrong and to correct them. And the, the attitude is just you do what I you do and I'll do what I do and don't tell me when I'm wrong. That's the attitude. You can't correct me. You can't tell me what to do. But according to the Bible, we need this. We need it because we need to fear. People have no fear of being corrected in most churches. They can go to the movies. They can watch anything they want. They can speak at home any way they want. They can see and do and, and have anything that they want in their lives and be uh, worldly and they can wear worldly t-shirts that have uh, bad slogans on them, and nobody will say a word to them. Nobody will say a word to them because there's no more rebuke in the churches. There's no more correction. There's no more expectation of godliness. And when there is a slight expectation of godliness, the bar is set so low that anybody without much effort can attain it. And there's no fear at all in most churches that you'll be rebuked. And that's a great shame to the Christian society. What we will do is we will train people in the churches to be worldly. We'll train them to be worldly. So they will be offended by someone who's godly. They will be offended by their godliness. And they won't, they won't be uh, able to look upon someone who's godly. In fact, there's, uh, our, there's a church in our area that had the billboard out that said, No perfect people allowed. And I was... I was um, considering that sign, no perfect people allowed. And of course, there aren't any perfect people. We know that. But let me ask you a question. If there was somebody who was perfect, if there was someone who walked so close to God, they were like Enoch, or they were like Noah, who in his generation was perfect, the Bible says. If there was somebody who was like Job, who was perfect and upright in his day, would you want them as a member of your church? Would you want Enoch or Job, who God said, look at my servant Job, he's upright and perfect. Would you want him in your church? Would you want him to be your mentor? Would you want him to walk beside you and show you a little something out of the scripture that he's found? Because he walked with God. And he walked with God so much that God took him. Wouldn't you want an Enoch in your church? Wouldn't you want a Job in your church? Wouldn't you want a Daniel? In the Bible, there's nothing recorded against Daniel in all of his life. Joseph the same way. No sins recorded against Joseph. It's not that he didn't sin. 
But there's nothing in the whole book of, of Genesis that ever mentions anything about Joseph or Daniel ever committing any sin. And they're the only two people in Scripture that are major figures that have no sin recorded against them. Wouldn't you want a Joseph in your church? A man who, when he was accosted by the wife of uh, his, uh, his master, ran and left his coat? Wouldn't you want a Job who could suffer and lose ten children and come out with the, with the blessing of God? and not curse God, even though his wife told him to? Wouldn't you want that guy in your church? I think I would put up a sign if we had one that said, if there are any perfect people, you're welcome here. Because that's what we want. We want the perfection of Christ in our life. We want to look like Christ. There's no desire for holiness anymore. And I would rather have ten people in my church who want to be perfect than to have a hundred people who don't. Because that's going to be a recipe for disaster. And we know there aren't any perfect people. But if there was two, I would want them both in my church. Because they would help me. And they would be an inspiration to me. And I would be able to see Christ in their life. And I would want to be like them. And I would want to walk with them. So if there are any perfect people, please come to our church and join it. And uh, we will enjoy your company. Um, and I want to be with anybody who loves Jesus. I want to be with anybody. I want to spend time with anybody who loves Christ. That is the m m intent of rebuking sin so that people will be more like Jesus Christ. So the idea that we don't want perfect people and we don't want to be around them is a disdain for holiness. It's a disdain for walking with Christ. It's a, it's having a, um, it's having a, uh, uh, I just lost the word I was going to say. It's a, this disdain for a Christ-like life and we're teaching it by allowing people to have no fear of any rebuke when they come into sin. All right, now let's move forward. Here he says in verse uh, 21, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be a partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. He's going to now give him this encouragement and charge not to have partiality. This is a temptation of ministers. To not have partiality. He calls to witness the Lord Jesus. He calls to witness God, the Lord Jesus, and the elect angels to give him this charge. He says, these are all going to be watching you to make sure you do what I tell you to do. And he says, remember that you work for God. Remember that Jesus is watching. Remember that the angels see everything you do. Don't forget the angels are watching. God is watching. Jesus is watching. And remember this very thing, that God who's watching you is not partial. God, is not, God does not uh, exhibit partiality. He does not prefer a man over another man. He is not, especially when it comes to guilt and innocence. We've dealt already with the reality that men will come and accuse the pastor of different things, and they may not be legitimate. And he says, don't be partial. Don't hear a man because you think he's probably guilty. You're going to hear the charges of a man. Don't listen to the charge because you prefer the man. Don't assume guilt because you're prejudiced against the person. Be careful. There is a God watching you. Remember who's watching all of your work. Remember who's keeping an eye on it. And men's equality is important to God. There needs to be no partiality in finding guilt. There needs to be no partiality in finding innocence. The truth is what matters. That's what matters when it comes to a problem. If there's a problem in the church, it's not about partiality. I knew he was going to do something like that. It's got to be the truth. The truth matters. What matters to God needs to matter to us. And God cares about finding the truth. He's not partial when it comes to your sin. And he's not partial. We ought not to be partial when it comes to other men's sins. And the partiality extends beyond those judgments. The partiality extends to favoritism. You know, the pastor is going to be warned here to lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be a partaker of other men's sins. There is a hastiness sometimes with the pastor. And what he will do is he will see what, what, we might con what we might call a shooting star. Someone who gets saved. Somebody who just looks like they've broken out of the gate for Christ. 
And what the pastor might do, because he's partial for some reason towards this person, is he'll promote him before it's time. Before he's been tested. And the man's just a shooting star and he fades too quickly. But all, 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 he's already been promoted. And now he fades and drops out of sight and it hurts the church. Then the pastor has to be careful not to promote people and lay hands on them before, their time, before it's time. He needs to be careful to watch their lives and give them a little time to mature and see if they're legitimate. See if it's not just a, a rocket shooting off the launch pad. You know, sometimes people come into the church and they become the star of illustrations. Every illustration has to do with this person. They just got saved. They just got baptized. They just got dried out from the baptismal pool and they've been at every service. And they are, um, they are the leading star illustrator at the church of a Christian. And there's a lot of pressure on that person. And everybody watches them. And they start telling people about Jesus. And people start coming to church because of them. And lo and behold, if six months later, they're not even in church. They're not around. You can't find them. And what happened? Well, the, they were just a shooting star. They, their, their conversion wasn't sincere. They got excited about religion. And they started coming and doing. And everybody saw their externals and saw it as Christianity. But time will tell. So the pastor needs to be careful not to have favoritism and lay hands on people suddenly. It can damage the reputation of the church, the reputation of Christianity. Give people a little time to come out of their, their shell, their flower to bud, and to see what they're going to be like. And it sometimes takes six months to a year, sometimes a little more, to see somebody, to see if they're going to be true to their confession. So the pastor has to be careful. What did travesty to where the pastor to promote somebody in front of everybody and then they fall away, and it looks like Christianity doesn't work. Christianity didn't work because it didn't help the person. They're back it's wallowing in the mud from which they were found. They're back licking up the vomit of the dog vomit that they have gone back to their old ways. And it's a sad thing, but the pastor needs to be careful not to see a shooting star and say that this is definitely a work of God. We are going to promote them now while we can, and then to find out only that it's just, a, um, it's just a passing phase in their life. It's a danger to us. We have to be careful. And it says here to uh, not to be a partaker of other men's sins. You know, when you, when you promote somebody who's not really got the Spirit of Christ, they get promoted and they want the opportunity. Sometimes they desire the place, they look for it, not for godly reasons. When somebody's not genuinely converted, they, they want to become a teacher because they want to see, have people listen to them. They want to become a, 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 a promoted person in the church because they want the position. And they want people to admire them and they want people to say, oh, look how much they've grown. And they get the most uh, improved player award and the most valuable player award for church. And everybody sees them as somebody. And now they found an opportunity to have pride. So the pastor can't participate in their sins by giving them a position and promoting their pride. He has to be able to discern, if he can, between the difference of someone who's just got a wicked motive or a genuine Christian motive. And we can't thrust wicked men upon people as leaders. When you thrust wicked men upon people as leaders, two things will happen. One, they will lead people into their own wickedness. And two, when they eventually do something very stupid because they don't have the Spirit of Christ, they will injure the people because the people will be hurt by it and the pastor will have partial responsibility for not discerning who was and who wasn't with Christ. And it's going to happen anyway to some degree. But it does not have to be the fault of the minister if he will uh, be able to take some time before he lays hands on people and not promote them early. Does that make sense? You see that there's a great danger in that. There's a great danger in promoting people early. He says, keep thyself pure. He doesn't want uh, Timothy to fall prey to someone else's lustful desire for power and promoting them, and the people are at risk. So the minister's job, you can see there from that, is to protect you. Protect you from somebody who wants to teach and not just wanting to teach because they love Jesus, but wants to teach because they want the power. That's not good for you. You want people who want your holiness at heart, who want your Christ-likeness, and they will do anything that they should do to get it. And then we find this last passage uh, here in verse 23. 
drink no longer wa water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. And we'll mention here quickly the minister's use of alcohol. I think it should be said that uh, Timothy obviously drank no alcohol. And I think that you'll find Paul had no problem with that. He did not rebuke Timothy for not drinking wine and say, you know, it's fine, don't be a teetotaler and don't uh, abstain from wine, that's no good. Uh, he actually speaks to him, and Timothy was someone who drank no wine at all. And Timothy is, is done right by that. Now what Paul has come and said to him is not to any, he's got stomach issues, uh, Timothy does. And he says, you have, I don't want you to only drink water for your stomach. What I want you to do is I want you to, um, uh, I want you to mix a little bit of the wa wine with the water and it'll help your stomach. And so he's given him some medical advice because obviously Timothy is a very strict man, a very uh, serious about his work, and he's a young man and he's got some sort of a problem with his stomach and, and Paul is concerned with it. And so he gives him this warning, and this, I mean, excuse me, he gives him this uh, uh, recommendation, and he wants him to use the, the alcohol there, the wine, mixed with the water as a medicine. And he's concerned about Timothy's health. And I think this is a wonderful passage, a wonderful portion of Scripture to remind us first that um, this situation here with Timothy demonstrates that uh, the ministers there, they didn't touch the wine. You know, the Levitical priests weren't allowed to drink wine. When they went to minister, they were to touch no wine. And it was common amongst the Egyptian men, uh, um, uh, the, their priests, they weren't allowed to drink wine. And it would, not be, um, it would not be rational to think that the Levitical priests and the Egyptian priests abstained from wine, but the Christians were drinking it the ministers of the gospel were not drinking wine at this time. And here he does not tell him that uh, he was to use it for any old purpose, but he told him to mix it with water and use it as a medicine. And so you can see that the, the wine was recommended for use as a medicine, and he's caring for Timothy's health. And he's told to use, notice the words here in verse 22, uh, verse 21 uh, through 3, a little wine. You know, it doesn't say a lot of wine. It doesn't say drink a bottle of wine with dinner. It says use a little wine for your stomach. Some ministers, if they were to read that, would read this as a rebuke. Because they've been told to drink a little wine when they don't normally drink a little wine. Timothy doesn't drink any, so it's not a rebuke to him. It's an encouragement to him to get healthy. But here, if some men were to read that, they would think a little wine. What are you saying? Did I drink too much wine? You see, he's telling him just a little in mixed in with your water. He's not telling him to drink a lot. He's telling him to drink just a little wine. And this is only what's necessary for his stomach. You see, you begin to see the purpose of what he's saying. This is necessary for his health. This is not a um, social event. This is not breaking up on a bottle of wine to celebrate something. This is not a uh, opening a bottle of wine to enjoy the taste of the wine so that you can enjoy it with your meats and fish. It's not a social drink when he has his friends over so that he can have a little alcohol with his buddies and enjoy himself. It's certainly not for anything to do with drunkenness, for the power of the alcohol in the wine to get him drunk. All this has to do with is for the, the man to have some medication and for him to be able to settle his stomach for whatever situation he had with his stomach. It wasn't for any of those other purposes that people drink wine today. And in fact, I think that we've got enough stomach medication that we don't need this kind of medication anymore. And I've never really met anybody who would say, I drink just a little wine for my stomach. I think there's probably something else better that's been invented by now that we could use as a medication. And I think that we'd be better off to use that medication than to take that wine and drink it and then run the risk of having um, given somebody the wrong impression. You see, here there was only probably one medication that would have worked for him, for his stomach, and that would have been something that could have helped him. But now we have lots, and we don't need the wine to do it. So Timothy has been instructed not to go and break open a bottle of wine and have it with dinner, 
and to uh, get a little tipsy and that that's okay. And people read this and they think, well, it's okay for me to go to the restaurant and have a glass of wine with dinner because Timothy had a stomach problem. I say, well, take some Nexium or do something, you know, get some Tums. It's some gas X, whatever it is that you need to get for your stomach, but you don't need a bottle of wine to do that. And Timothy didn't drink a bottle of wine to fix his stomach. He'd mixed a little bit with his water to help him with his stomach issues. And that's what's being done here. This isn't social drinking. This isn't drunkenness. And don't use this as an excuse to break open a six pack and go home after work and say that I want to take a, take a little rest, just like Timothy did. Because Paul told him he could have a little wine for his stomach, and I'm going to have a 12 pack uh, beer with my dinner or with my, for my evening because Timothy could do it. This isn't a license for us to get drunk, and it's not a license for us to have all this alcohol. The Bible says very plainly, don't look upon the wine when it turns red in the cup. Don't stare at that thing, it's going to destroy your life. You'll wake up after having destroyed your life, and what will you say after you've been a complete fool the night before? Where's the drink so I can have some more? That's what will happen to you. You'll be looking for the next drink. And that's not what's going on here. So Timothy was a man who drank no alcohol. And I think uh, unless you have exactly what Timothy had and you had only the remedies that Timothy had, you'd be good to take his example and drink no alcohol just like Timothy. That would be your best bet. And should you uh, have exactly what Timothy had and have only the remedy that Timothy had, I think you'd be licensed to drink a little alcohol to help your stomach. And other than that, I think you'd be best off to do what he did, which was to abstain completely from it. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. What a, what a great instruction. And as a minister of the Lord, it causes me to think, oh, help me not to hurt anybody. Help me not to offend anyone. Help me not to sin against you. Help me not to lay hands on anyone too soon. And, and Lord, there are so many vices that a minister could fall into. The pride of the position, the, the power that you can have over people, the, the adulation that people will give you, even the... Um, even the ability to, to, to try to indulge in something that would hurt somebody else if they were to do it, like this alcohol. Oh God, keep me from those things so that I don't hurt anyone and that Jesus Christ's name will be glorified. And help me to see the people perfected in the name of Jesus. Help me to be used of that. And Lord, I pray that the people will fear to sin, that they'll be concerned that it is a real thing, that it is a hurtful thing, that it hurts Jesus and it hurts us and it hurts our brothers and our sisters and the next generation even. Lord, Lord, keep us from hurting anybody, but help us to be a blessing. In the name of Jesus, amen.